All right, again, good evening, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to our virtual program. Tonight, we have um, Justin Kronig with the Stone Silo Prairie Gardens in De Pere to talk about native um, pollinator plants for your home landscape. With that, I'm gonna turn my video off and uh, welcome you, Justin, thanks for coming. Thank you for having me. And thanks for coming, everybody, to, uh, to hear what I have to say about native plants. So my name is Justin Craning. I'm the owner of Stone Silo Prairie Gardens, which is in De Pere, Wisconsin. I'm gonna hold my card up here so you can see it. And uh, my phone number is on there and our address is on there. It's uh, 2325 Oak Ridge Circle. We're uh, just south of G on GV, south of Costco. So we're, we're pretty easy to find. Um, and what we do at Stone Silo Prairie Gardens is we grow native plants. And what I mean by that is plants that are ambiguous to the area. So plants that were already here before European settlers came and started bringing other plants in. Um, and so I have a two year associate degree in landscape horticulture from NWTC. Um, and when I was there, we learned a lot about roses and hostas and keeping gardens really nice and clean and tidy. And, uh, and then I, when I graduated, I bought this native plant nursery. So I had to learn all about native plants. So it's been a really, um, fun experience for me. I bought it in 2011 and I'm still learning new things every day. There's so many native plants out there that are so interesting and cool and, and uh, unique. So it's really nice to be able to put those plants back into nature. And those plants are really wonderful for environment, which I'll talk about quite a bit. Um, so how I, how I ended up here was I had to do an internship for my, my program at school. And I did an internship for On Broadway Incorporated. And I did the planter bowls on Broadway Street in Green Bay. Um, so they have annual plants in there. So flowering annuals, but at the time, wild ones, I uh, wanted to put some native plants in some of the bowls. So that's how I ended up at Stone Silo Prairie Garden. So if, if anybody's not familiar with wild ones, uh, this is wild ones right here. And what wild ones is, is a nonprofit group that focuses on the use of native plants. Um, and it's, it has grass roots here, right in Wisconsin. So um, the, the main uh, headquarters is in Appleton. Um, and it was, it was formed in Milwaukee. So it's, uh, it's a great group to be involved with if you're looking to learn more about native plants and if you're looking to um, just get more information on native plants. So, so they wanted to put some native plants in the planter bowls at, uh, on the Broadway district in the streets. And so I had to come here and get those plants. And at the same time, my parents were building a house and up kind of near Crivets. And it's all sand up there and we don't really have time to water things because they weren't always up there. And the deer were there, so the deer really loved them. So everything I would plant as far as roses or hostas or you know, daff well, daffodils grew, but certain things that I planted that I learned at school, they were really struggling, really having a hard time to grow. So I came here and uh, I said, hey, I, I'd like to get some plants from here and try them out. And they grew really well. So I kept coming back. And that's how I ended up um, meeting the, the previous owners of the business. And that's how I ended up buying the business. Um, so I want to talk today about some plants that are a little more conducive for the landscape because some native plants can be a little bit quick. Uh, there's plants like cup plant and wild bee balm. Um, some of those plants, they need a big area. They're going to they're gonna expand, they're going to spread, and they're not going to be invasive, but they can be aggressive. And they, they often become aggressive when we give them the opportunity. So in our, in our landscape beds, in our nice mulch, nice, you know, great soil and things like that, um, they can have a tendency to be a little pushy. So I'm going to talk about the ones that aren't as pushy. Um, I'm going to start with some shade plants first because a lot of us have shade. Um, so this right here, I'm going to hold it up there for a little bit, is a New Jersey tea. And this is a, this is a shrub in a sense. It's very herbaceous in a way where it will grow back um, from its base, but it will also grow back from its you know, wood from the previous year. So it's a wonderful plant for, uh, it's a host plant for many butterflies and moths and things like that. And it's also a great nectar plant. And a lot of these plants that I grow, they, they are great supportive plants. So they're gonna, they're gonna feed something. And so when we look in our gardens, um, when you start doing natural gardening uh, and you see things chewed upon, that's a good thing. We wanna see that. We wanna see our leaves chewed on, or we wanna see, you know, maybe some sort of leaf miners, things like that. Um, that's not to be concerned about with these plants. That's what we want. 
Um, so that's New Jersey tea, great shrub. It gets about three feet tall. It does take some time to mature, which is kind of common with a lot of native plants. So this isn't something that you're going to do really quick. Um, but once it does happen, things then tend to happen a little quicker. So the plants take some time to grow. So it's kind of a sleep, creep, and leap thing. The first year they sort of sit there and they don't really do a whole lot. And the second year they'll grow and they'll, they'll get some flowers and some seeds and then spread a little bit. And then the third year they'll kind of really start to expand. Um, the one that likes to expand a lot is uh, barren strawberry. That's barren strawberry. And uh, when you come to a stone silo or a lot of nurseries, uh, you'll find that you know, they all have a list of things that the plants require on either a sign or on a tag. And when you're, when you're doing your landscape design, you want to think about those things. You want to think about where the plant goes. So native plants are not no maintenance. They are certainly not. They require some maintenance and they require to be in the right spot. So the right plant for the right spot is, is very key. So you want to look at your conditions, your sunlight conditions, your moisture conditions, and your soil conditions. Um, barren strawberry is one that'll go just about anywhere in the shade. And it's a great ground cover for the shade. Another good ground cover for the shade is zigzag goldenrod. Now goldenrod often gets kind of a kind of a bad name. Um, a lot of people think that goldenrod it creates allergies. It's it's not goldenrod that's creating allergies. It's typically in bloom at the same time that ragweed is in bloom. The ragweed is going to give the allergies and Ragweed, its flower isn't very attractive, so we don't often notice it. But uh, Saladago, which you'll see, if you can see that really well, um, is the Latin name for goldenrod. Um, and it's a very productive plant. So all the different goldenrods are really great pollinator plants. They feed the, the uh, bees and the butterflies late in the season. And, and those, those insects, they need that food, that nectar, late in the season so they can overwinter or make their trip back to wherever they go. Um, so it's a great food source. Another good uh, shade plant is called prairie elm leaf. And many people are probably familiar with uh, coral bells. Um, and this is the native coral bells. So there's a whole bunch of different cultivars out there of this plant. So a lot of your native plants um, actually have cultivars, which we see at most of our garden centers. So this is coral bells or hookera. Um, and this is basically just the green one. So a lot of the ones you'll see, they'll have like reds or purple on the leaves. This one is just the green. So it's a very nice ground cover. It's a kind of a short, you know, moundy sort of plant and it doesn't spread overly fast. So it's a, it's a good one for the shade. Um, let's see here. And then I always like to talk about in the shade, different ferns. I'll show you one. This one is maidenhair fern. Maidenhair fern is a really nice, short, fairly well-behaved fern. Uh, it does like shade and moisture, um, so it needs to have that. And it also likes to have semi-rich soils. It doesn't, doesn't really care for clay too much, um, but it will grow in clay. But it's a very nice textured fern. It's not, it's not super aggressive. Um, and it's very it has a very fine texture to it, so it offers a, a beautiful fine uh, look within the landscape, and it's and it's very much a ground cover as well. Um, and then we have uh, foam flower, which is one of my favorite shade plants. Um, and this will also take part sun. A lot of these plants are fairly adaptable, um, where they'll take you know sun to shade, and and some of these plants can handle different environments. So this one here will, will take shade to part sun. I wouldn't put it in the full sun in really dry conditions, but it does like to have a little bit of sun. And it gets a very, very interesting flower that gets almost a pink hue to it as it, as it comes into bloom. Um, great little ground cover for the shade. And then when we talk about uh, you know ground covers, I always look at different sedges. This one here is this uh, common Common uh, fox sedge, but you'll see the name Carex. Carex is the Latin name for sedge, essentially. And I like to use sedges in the shade um, as the ground cover. It, it creates a very meadow appearance. Um, and then you use different sedges, so you have different textures 
and, and they're great ground covers. So they're good at keeping weeds out and it's almost like a green mulch. So instead of having, you know, your plants that you like and whatever, for whatever reason you have them for, um, which you always want to think about when you're doing your design, you want to think about what is the function of the plant that I'm going to use? What, what's it going to do? Is it going to anchor a spot? Is it going to create a pathway? Is it going to make a screen? There's all sorts of things that you can have as a function, but form follows function. So basically that means that we want it to function first and then if it functions, it'll look good. Um, so I like to take my plants that I'm gonna have in, you know, in areas and, and set them in, plant them, and then plant sedges amongst them and let the sedges become the green mulch, um, which essentially reduces a lot of things. It reduces the need for water, it reduces uh, erosion, and it, it reduces the need for mulching every year, and it, and it reduces maintenance. So it reduces weeding, um, which is a good thing in my in my book. So, so we'll talk a little bit about maintenance before we go on to sun plants. Um, so like I said earlier, native plants are not maintenance free. They do require some maintenance. When you buy a, ma a native plant, um, whether it's from me or from Prairie Nursery or from Prairie Moon Nursery or or any, anybody that's selling them, I highly encourage everybody to, to talk to your local local uh, greenhouses and, and, and nurseries and, and tell them that you'd like to see some native plants. Because the more native plants we have available, the more we can use. So if they're, if they're not maintenance free. Um, so when you buy one, you're gonna wanna water it in. You're gonna wanna water it in for the first week. I would water it probably once a week or once every couple of weeks, depending on how much rain we're getting. For the first year and then after that you want it to be on its own so you shouldn't have to water the second year um as far as cutting back the plants i wait till spring and the reason i do that is uh for one for the plant's health you know the plant all year long it produces all this material and it grows all this material and then when it gets cold it lays that material down on its root structure which is a great insulation for its roots and on years like this where we kind of went from snow to no snow and cold the snow to probably two feet of snow, um, which hopefully not two feet, but 15 inches maybe. Um, it's it's important to have that that little bit of insulation for the for the roots. And then also it's really great for insects to have all the stalks and the stems and the leaves. Um, those are places for insects to harbor over the winter. And insects are bird food. So in within our landscape, if we can create a place for insects to thrive. We will have birds coming in. I'm sure most of us want to see that. Um, I often look at a landscape and I think about what it looks like, but I, I often look at it and I think about what's going on in it. And that's that's often more important to me is to see wildlife moving through it, to see birds, to see butterflies, to see bees, to see oh, mammals, bunnies, squirrels, whatever it may be. Um, I'm not a gardener that's opposed to bunnies. Once these plants get up and grow, they can eat all they want. Uh, here at the nursery, we have bunnies running around all over the place. And I see very little damage on my plants because they there's so many of plants I've planted so densely and with such diversity that we really don't notice any damage. So that's kind of the, my maintenance approach is to water the first year. I never fertilize, but I always pay attention to my soil types and I try to match my plants to that in my environment as far as the light and moisture goes in the soil. Um, and then I'll wait until spring to cut the, the old plant material back. And sometimes I won't even do it. I have gardens here at the nursery that are kind of large areas. Um, and, and what we'll do is we'll just leave that dead material there and it, the new plants will come up through it. And, and you'll see that dead material till about mid-June but after that um, a lot of that stuff is gone because what the birds do is they take all that dead plant material and they use it for nesting material which is another great thing for the environment <clears throat> excuse me so we'll talk about some sun plants that are good for the landscape <clears throat> one of our most popular ones is, is butterfly weed or otherwise known as orange milkweed so this is a milkweed uh, you can see here the latin name is Asclepius. It's Asclepius tuberosa. Um, and this is one of the more well-behaved uh, milkweeds. It will spread um, by tuber and by seed, but it's a beautiful plant. It gets about three feet tall and it has an orange flower. And like I say, it's a host plant for the monarch caterpillar. So and I'm sure a lot of us know that milkweed is the only food source for the monarch caterpillar. And there's some other, so there's some other creatures that are like that. 
um, that are very specific to what they're going to eat. Uh, and then there's some creatures that aren't. So there's swallowtails will eat anything from dill to carrots to golden Alexander, which is a native plant. Um, and they also feed on a lot of trees and things like that and different shrubs. And uh, so some, some, uh, some caterpillars are very specific and some are not. Well, this plant right here is called aromatic aster. And this is an aster. And I like to mention asters because like the goldenrod, this is a very late blooming plant. Um, so it's gonna be a good food source for butterflies and bees coming into the fall, coming in the winter, um, and they need that to, to survive. So a good one, an aromatic aster. Here we have purple poppy mallow. Yep, purple poppy mallow, I had, had to double check there. And this is kind of a sprawling plant. So this, this one is sort of, it's not viney, but it'll kind of creep along the ground and it's a very good ground cover. It has a beautiful purple flower that blooms throughout the year. Um, it does spread a little bit. In some places it likes it more than others, uh, but, it, but it's fairly well behaved. Um, and this is an interesting plant. I like to use it on rock walls because it kind of cascades down. Um, so it's a good one for that. Then we have a nice little ground cover for the sun. And this is called prairie smoke. And uh, this is a spring blooming plant. So it's one of the first sun loving plants to bloom as far as native plants go. So with native plants, um, you don't get a whole lot going on early in the season in the sun. Uh, they are fairly slow to emerge. Because I mean they're accustomed to our weather, so they know that it could get cold in late April and May. Um, but this is one that kind of blooms a little bit earlier than a, than a lot of them. A lot of your color, uh, as far as natural plants or native native plants to our area, is usually going to be in the shade. So things like your your spring ephemerals, like your trilliums and your your Dutchman's britches and your Virginia bluebells, those things are all blooming really early in the season. I know they're very important plants for our early feeding bees. Our things that are that are emerging early in the year are, are usually going to be feeding on the spring ephemerals or tree and shrub flowers. Um, so it's very important to have that food source throughout the year. It's a bloom time diversity is what I call it. Um, and you want to have that in your landscape for the pollinators and for, for wildlife. You want to have things throughout the whole season blooming. And it's also quite attractive to us. Um, and then we can talk a little bit about winter because we're in winter right now and it sounds like we're gonna be even more in the winter. Um, one of the other reasons I like to leave my plants up through the, through the winter and not cut them back in the fall is that these, these plants offer really great winter interest. So a lot of the grasses and the coneflowers, um, they all hold up through the winter and they stand up tall and it, and it offers something in, in the landscape throughout the winter instead of having just, just nothing but snow. You have all the grasses coming up and all the stalks from all the different flowering plants. And that, that makes it quite attractive look in the winter time. Um, another plant that's good for the sun. And this one likes to be in the full sun. And this is one of the plants that takes a long time to grow. So this is a, probably a five year investment before you really start to see its maturity. Um, this is blue false indigo. And uh, so the Baptisia, and a uh, very often used uh, landscape plant. There's a lot of cultivars um, for this plant. So it's, there's a lot of different kinds that you can get, but the, the native ones that we have to Wisconsin are the, the blue false indigo, the white false indigo, and cream false indigo. Um, and it's sort of a shrub-like plant. So it's gonna get about four or five feet tall, depending on its conditions. Um, it, it will grow very well in the sand and the dry conditions. And this has a very big root. Um, so some native plants have really large tap roots, quite a few of them do. Um, and that's good for our soil. That's good for the structure of the soil. It's good for erosion control. Um, it helps with uh, water infiltration. So when you have big plants with big roots that send their big roots down into the ground, eventually the plant dies. And we don't normally notice it because a new one has taken its place. Either a seed grew or an offshoot or something. Um, but eventually the plant will die. And then that large root that can sometimes go into the ground <clears throat> up to 15 or 20 feet, 
will uh, die and decompose. And that, that helps water infiltrate the soil. And then when you have natural gardens or natural areas in your, in your landscape, um, all that plant material will help slow down runoff. And then with all those roots in the ground, it'll help water infiltrate the soil. And it, it really is great for reducing flooding issues, which we're starting to see in a lot of municipalities. Um, because what we've done is we've taken away a lot of the, the sponges of the world, a lot of the areas that take up water um, and we've replaced it with turf or concrete or roofs. Um, and that's part of the reason why we're seeing a lot of flooding issues. So if everybody kind of does just a little bit in your landscape to help infiltrate the water into your soil, that could potentially help out a lot of those issues. Another one with a big, big taproot is lead plant. And this plant is a legume, so it's in the pea family. And this is a sub shrub. It's a, so it's very much a shrub in a sense, but it will also grow from its base. The bunnies do love it, but if they eat it, it'll come back from its base. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So what you do is you treat this much like Russian sage. A lot of people are probably familiar with Russian sage. Uh, you wait until it starts to actually leaf out and it's fairly late to do that. So in about early June or so, uh, maybe late May, depending on the weather, it'll leaf out. And then what you do is you cut back the stalks that, that didn't create any leaves. Um, so instead of cutting it right back to the ground, all the way to the ground, you, you kind of let it, let it leaf out and then you just take the dead off essentially. Another good one for the landscape is uh, the prairie clovers. Um, they are also in the, in the legume family. Um, also very well preferred by the bunnies. They do like this plant. So you gotta sometimes protect it. If you have you know, a lot of bunnies in your area and say you're just getting started with your natural garden, um, you might wanna protect this plant and a few others for the first year or two until it establishes and starts to grow babies and starts to spread um, because they can be a little, a little bit aggressive on this one. They, they really like this one, um, which is not a bad thing. You know, you're feeding wildlife in the end, you're doing, you're doing some good. And uh, so some people have bunnies that are a little more aggressive on their plants. Um, I call those usually not so smart bunnies. And then some people have bunnies that will, will eat some of the plant, but won't eat it all. And those are your farming bunnies and they're actually helping you out. Um, they're, they're doing a little bit of work for you. They're, they're cutting back some of the plant material on top so that it can form more roots. Um, and with lead plant, like I said, this one has a very large taproot um, and it's just a beautiful flower, um, the beautiful purple flower and the foliage is very interesting and it is favored by a lot of different pollinators. Um, so then we do it, we do grow a bunch of different grasses. Um, we grow a little blue stem and we grow a big blue stem and we grow Indian grass. Uh, but one I like to talk about a lot is prairie drop seed. And a lot of people are familiar with prairie drop seed. There's a bunch of different cultivars out there. It's, it's quite often. It's a really nice filler grass. It's nice and full and it has a very lacy kind of texture to it. Um, so it's a good grass. And grasses are great in a natural landscape. And the reason that is that they, they have a, a fibrous root system, which will actually compete with the native plants and sort of hold them back a little bit. So one of the main complaints, or not complaints, but one of the things that happens a lot with native plants is that if you plant them in an area that doesn't have a whole lot of competition, they often get taller than they you know, they say on the sign. It's like they don't get the memo and they don't want to grow really tall, and then they get really tall and they kind of flop over. Um, so grasses can help avoid that by creating uh, a root structure in the ground that competes with it. And uh, so, sorry, it's hard to hear me. I'll try to speak up a little bit more. So that's that's prairie drop seed right there. A very lacy, attractive grass. One thing I like to do is I like to go through different catalogs. Um, and there's some different companies that have catalogs. I do not put on a catalog, but uh, prairie, prairie Nursery and Prairie Food Nursery. They both put out catalogs. Sounds. We're having a problem hearing. Um, yeah. How is, how is that? It's just me. I um, we could hear you fine, and then all of a sudden it got really muffled. 
And maybe it's because I'm holding things in front of my face. <laughs> now I now I can hear you, Justin. Okay, excellent. So I like to use these catalogs. Um, they help with finding out your different requirements for your plants. Um, and they also have some great pictures that we can see. That, for instance, this is the butterfly weed right here, and they have they'll have all the different information um, that you need to decide whether or not you're putting it in, in a good place. Um, it's going weird again. Okay. I wonder if it's internet connection. Um, it's kind of in and out. So um, it could be. But now I can hear you again. So I'm going to mute really myself. Good. All right. Another book that I like to use is this uh, Wisconsin's or Wildflowers of Wisconsin. This book is really great. This has plants in it that you're really not accustomed to seeing. Um, it also does show a lot of different meat and stuff. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to see if we can take a walk. And we're going to look at some plants, some seedlings that we have. Um, so this is our greenhouse here. Um, we're just getting started. I'm actually going to see if I can flip my camera around. And I don't know how to do that. Let's see. Nope, I don't know how to do that. So we're just going to turn it this way, and that's okay. Um, I can see what we're looking at. So these are all seed trays that we've started, um, and these are all recently done. So they don't, they don't have anything growing them yet. So what we have to do with our seeds is we have to stratify our seeds. So what we do is in those catalogs <clears throat> or on a seed packet, where you normally get a seed packet, it'll give you a germination code. And it could be a, a number of things. So it could be you have to cold moist for 30 days or 60 days, or sometimes you have to scratch the seed with a piece of sandpaper. Um, sometimes you have to put them in hot water. Um, so there's a number of different things that we have to do to our seeds. And what we're doing is we're tricking the seed into thinking it made it through winter. So what the what the mother plant does in the whenever it's ready to set seeds, some plants set seeds in the spring, some plants set seeds in the summer or fall. It's always after flowering. Uh, but what it does is it tells its seed to not grow until after it's made it through winter because we don't want or the plant doesn't want its babies to grow. And let's say it puts its seed off in September and we get a, a week of of 80 degree weather it doesn't want it to grow then because then it'll be a little baby plant when winter comes and that'll kill it so what we're, we're doing is we're stratifying our seeds and that that gets them ready to grow so this plant right here this plant is anis hyssop or agastache um and this one has the the smell of black licorice uh so it's, it's a really interesting plant that's not one of the best for the landscape. If you have a large area, this is a good plant. This is a very opportunistic plant. So it'll basically find anywhere it can to grow. Um, how, how are we doing on hearing me now? Hearing me pretty good? Okay. Sound is good. All right. And I'm kind of talking close to the phone since I figured maybe we're having a little issue there. So um, this right here is a uh, shorts aster. So this is an aster right here, and that's getting ready to grow. That's starting to starting to pop. And then we have some grasses. This would be uh, June grass right here. And June grass is a nice little short landscape grass that gives a flower off in June. So it's quite attractive in June, which is different from a lot of the grasses. So this is a cool season grass. So we have warm season grasses and cool season grasses. And the warm season ones tend to take a little longer to get going. Um, they're usually not coming out of the ground until you know, maybe June. Um, and that's also the same situation with a lot of things like milkweed. Um, so if you plant a, a warm season grass or a milkweed and you don't see it coming up right away in the spring, don't be too concerned. They, they usually take some time. Um, there's another aster right here that's called smooth blue aster. And then we have right here, this is great coneflower. It's a Rebecca. And then right here we have Landsleaf Coreopsis. 
That's Landsleaf Coreopsis. And Landsleaf Coreopsis is a great uh, flowering plant. It has a yellow flower on it. Um, it gets about knee high or so. But this plant loves the sand. And if you have clay, I wouldn't even plant it. But if you have sand, it definitely likes to get up and grow. Um, here we have a blazing star. Uh, this is a Laartris. This is dotted blazing star. Uh, the one that we like to grow a lot and that does really well for the butterflies is metal blazing star, uh, Laartris ligulus stylus. So metal blazing star. And that's the one that the butterflies are really attracted to. Here's a plant that I talked about earlier. Some insects are very uh, specific to what they'll eat. This plant is wild lupine. And it's, uh, it's the food source for the, and it's the only food source for the Carner blue butterfly, which is an endangered species. Um, this plant is also much like uh, Landsleaf coreopsis, where it really likes sand. If you don't have sand, it doesn't, doesn't do overly well. So as you can see, we're kind of just getting started on planting. Um, we have about, probably about, eh, 30,000 plugs planted so far, and we're gonna keep on working away at that, that's for sure. Um, here we have some columbine. And columbine is a great little shade plant. Um, and it's a great food source for, for hummingbirds. Hummingbirds love this plant. And these are actually little baby plants to be dug out of the greenhouse floor. So sometimes we have plants that'll actually seed in here and then grow on the, on the floor, and then we just pop them out of the ground and, and put them in pots. So let's see here. So as you can see, we, we use lids over our trays uh, to keep moisture in. You can kind of see how the moisture comes off of there. And we do that until the seeds all start to grow and then we start taking the lids off. We have four of these tables that, that we actually start our seeds in. We'll get over here, we'll take a look at, here's some milkweed. Um, this is showy milkweed. You can see they're just starting to get going. And milkweed is a little tough from seeds sometimes. It's very favored by aphids. So in our greenhouse, what we do, instead of using pesticides, uh, we start introducing um, things like assassin bugs and ladybugs, uh, natural predators to the, the pests that we have that, that show up in our greenhouse. So we, we don't use any pesticides in our plants because uh, all of our plants are gonna be eaten by bugs at some point. So we don't wanna have that in there because we, that'd be a little counterproductive. Here we have uh, the, the indigo. So this is, this is white false indigo. Um, I mentioned blue false indigo earlier. Here's the blue one right here. They look very much alike. Um, and it's very interesting with some of our native plants to watch them grow in the ground compared to watching them grow from little baby seeds. So uh, for instance, indigo, this right here, this is what it looks like as a seedling, but when it comes out of the ground, once it's mature, it actually kind of looks like asparagus. So some plants look a lot different when they're seedlings to when they come out of the ground. And uh, something to talk about a little bit is, and one of the biggest things I hear, um, I'm going to get back over my table here, is that when sometimes when people plant the native garden, um, they're a little concerned about how to maintain it as far as weeds go. Uh, they, they get concerned that they're going to pull the wrong thing. So my theory on that is to look at your garden. You know, once you've planted it, you know where you put the plants you planted. Um, and let's focus on the weeds. Let's learn our weeds. So if you see dandelions in there or buckthorn or thistle that's not native, um, and we do have some native thistles that we grow, and typically the underside of the leaves on native thistles are gonna be a silvery kind of who to them. So a silver color to them. Um, but let's focus on the weeds first. So get in there, pull the weeds out. And then if you have a plant that's acting like a weed, treat it like a weed. So a weed is nothing more than an unwanted plant. Um, so for instance, you could have Jack in the pulpit, which is probably not gonna be a weed to anybody, but if it comes up in an area where you wanted to have uh, 
you know, a New Jersey tea and they're kind of pushing on each other, well, then it becomes a weed. So essentially a weed is nothing more than an unwanted plant. So if you could have the most beautiful rose bush or whatever, your most favorite plant in the middle of a cornfield and to the farmer, it is, it is a weed. So that's one thing I, I like to talk about when I'm talking about maintenance is to uh, let's focus on the weeds first and then worry about the rest of the plants. Um, because a lot of times the babies are gonna look different than, than the mature ones. So I am gonna leave it up to have any questions. So if anybody has any questions, you can chime in and, and see if we can uh, get some questions answered. <laughs> 